On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Sanjay Fernando. He is the SVP of Artificial Intelligence and Analytics Platforms at Optum. We're going to cover a few different topics with him on this episode. We're going to be talking about how capabilities within the AI and analytics space are viewed at Optum. Are they a competitive advantage? Are they now becoming a necessity? We're going to talk about how ROI and, and budgets within a, a large company like Optum work in terms of process. And I'm really excited to have him on and I appreciate your time. Thanks, Sanji. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So just to set context for listeners out there, if you could just kind of give us a little a high level of who you are, what you do, and we'll dive in from there. Well, today I'm part of Optum Insight, which is part of uh, one third or one of the business units under Optum. You know, just a quick explanation of who Optum is. We are about one half of United Health Group, and then many of your listeners hopefully are very familiar with our sister company, United Healthcare. Optum is a diversified health services company. We touch almost every part of the U.S. healthcare system, you know, from delivering care to working with federal and state governments to working with other insurers and hospital systems in all manner of how we get and receive and pay for healthcare in the U.S. today. And so it's an exciting place to be, and I'm responsible for a couple of things. My team looks at unique business problems that sort of span our business, uh, not just Optum Insight, but Optum Care and Optum Rx, our pharmacy benefit business, to really understand if there are common AI solutions we could build. And we also focused on the common platforms that anyone in the company can use to build and train new machine learning solutions, as well as new analytics. And so these two responsibilities make up the bulk of my portfolio of responsibilities and really help us not only impact the business with artificial intelligence and machine learning, but also help others across the business scale up to leverage it themselves. Interesting. I guess just to touch on that, because I'm just kind of curious, when you're at, from your position, you're, you're evaluating strategy and, and trying to find common AI solutions, I guess, what are some of the requirements that kind of you know, tie in together that let you see that more maybe holistic view, but also some commonality to leverage, I guess, you know, the investment in AI? Yeah, you know, there's not a perfect recipe for this, but there are some sort of core principles that help guide us to work on meaningful solutions. You know, and first and foremost is solving the business problem, whether it's AI or any other technology. I mean, this goes back through our years, you know, anyone's years of experience in building successful technology solutions is that having a, a very clear focus and understanding of what you're trying to solve is really important. And then, you know, regardless of whether it touches one part of our business or many parts of a business, it's almost like you need that singular focus as a place to start. And then we absolutely think about the data that we might have available to train against. But more importantly, the almost the labels or answers or decisions that are attached with that label that we could learn from. Not that everything has to be a supervised learning problem, but we prefer those because they feel and have been sort of easier to solve, easier to get to clear benefit and outcomes. And it's only after we've sort of solved a problem in one place do we then think about, well, is it actually a problem somewhere else? And that might feel a little bit, you know, thinking in reverse. But my personal experience has been that if you're not singularly focused on a problem, and if you try to sort of over-optimize for solving multiple problems at the same time, you can necessarily, at least I have failed at that. Like you can necessarily sort of not do a great job solving all the problems at the same time very well. And so my personal approach is to get really focused, solve the problem in one area of the space, and then figure out if we can apply it or if we can modify or we can expand the capabilities to solve other problems later. And we found uh, a decent amount of success with that approach. Interesting. So I guess when you're you know, kind of looking at uh, you know, the big picture, obviously your AI is tricky, right? ROI of AI is something I've, I guess I've discussed on other episodes and you know, convincing somebody of maybe potentially the first time a department or a unit or, or the company is experiencing or leveraging an AI solution. And hey, we're going to put this in and it's going to benefit us X, Y, Z and we've never done it and we got to evaluate that. Do you come across that in your position in terms of having to you know, look at the ROI of AI and, and kind of uh, you know, maybe going into areas you've not touched before? 
Absolutely. I mean, that's at the heart of any sort of fundamental business decision would, you know, I think anyone would make in making an investment in technology. If I think about the arc of this, you know, I've been in my current role for about a year and a half. But before that, I was in more of an R&D setting at Optum Labs, where we first started exploring the use of artificial intelligence. And so that question on return on investment was central, especially when you have more of an R&D lens to this. You've got to do a lot to convince appropriately, not that this is a stumbling block, but you should be asked to and expected to do a lot to justify why such a complex capability that requires a great deal of investment in people and technology should be made to improve a business. Along the way, you know, we started to see some things that work for us in the AI space that work to our advantage when you're in that sort of mode of really trying to validate whether or not this could be impactful to the business. One thing we found is that when we think about ROI, we could think about it as increasing revenue or reducing cost in the business. And while there's a ton of opportunity to build new products and features that can increase the revenue and grow your market share in different ways for any business, reducing cost is also a really great way to get started because this is a bit nuanced, but if you think about reducing the cost to do something, a very easy example, say I take any technology solution, AI included, and and reduce the cost of doing something from $100 to $75. That $25 is sort of bankable almost, like that's real bottom line savings. If I were to create a new product that I could sell for maybe $100, that is a great opportunity, but there's a cost to that. It costs to acquire the customers, costs to frame that, costs to deliver that product. And so you know, it's a long way to saying, like, I think sometimes we found focusing on cost, reducing the cost of operation with artificial intelligence has been some of our more successful business cases. Not all of them, but it may help people when they face that question of how do I justify this kind of investment? Absolutely. And, and I guess when you're going to you know, make the case for budget and, and trying something where the company's going to benefit, maybe it is tangible, maybe it's intangible, I don't know. When you're looking at that, are you trying to position that as more of a you know, true core capability you're adding to Optum? I mean, is it a competitive advantage at that point or just maybe within the, the context of you know, AI and, and what you guys are seeing and you know, kind of what you just talked about? Is, is that kind of now a necessity just to be competitive? I think we're at a moment of inflection where it is fast becoming a necessity. And it's fast becoming a necessity for a couple of reasons. Not only, you know, as you would expect, because of the natural evolution of these technologies, the maturation of them, the ease and the improvements that we can build and train these models in and really understand their performance and output. So that's making this more accessible and more available to the industry as a whole. But the other piece of this is that the volume of information and decision-making in healthcare, in part driven through technology and digitization is almost forcing many of us to recognize that without more sophisticated ways to understand the information being presented, whether it be in electronic medical records and in wearable technology, in the claims and reimbursement information that we've been using for decades, there's so much more of it that we need capabilities like artificial intelligence, like machine learning to even process and understand that volume of information. And so maybe, you know, we are in a journey and, you know, you might get a a wide range of answers from healthcare leaders as to how central AI is in their business. But I think, and we have a survey that we do every year, and you just continue to see that grow every year where it's becoming more important, more relevant to those leaders every year, because I think it has to, given the explosion of information and the maturation of this technology. Absolutely. You know, it just occurred to me. I mean, I think it's actually quite interesting because I think within the healthcare space and then you, you look at insurance, it's so broad and so much can be done, right? With so much data. And I was actually thinking about the data side of this for maybe, you know, Optum, maybe United Health, but just with as much data as you guys have, there'll never be enough, right? Because there's always downstream, meaning there's a lab, there's a doctor, there's a hospital that has just a little bit more data. Are those challenges that 
you know, I guess maybe this is more of an industry-wide question. Are those challenges that are being seen like in terms of, hey, if we have that data, we're going to provide better insights and all of a sudden now there's a better supply chain in terms of how we're sharing data? Yeah, you know, and I'm not the expert because I think that data interoperability across our healthcare system is incredibly important. And a couple of my colleagues here at Optum are well steeped in how we can improve that, how we should improve that, how, you know, breakthroughs like FIRE, CQL are all starting to help unlock some of that for us. And I think it is very accurate to say that, like, United Health Group is one of the largest players in the market in our sister company, United Healthcare, I believe is still like the largest private insurer in the US. And even then, you would think at that scale, you would have, and we do have a lot of data, but we have a lot of missing gaps. Like you said, you know, like, you know, every time you might see a doctor, every time you might fill a prescription, you know, healthcare is such a vast part of our lives and a part of our economy that it's very difficult to say any of us, big players or small players, have sort of an end-to-end view of this. And I think the improvements we are making to share data, to share data safely, are going to continue to help with this. I don't think there's a finish line here, but I think things are getting better. And I think there's a lot of smart people working on this and a lot of recognition across the industry that we should be sharing data appropriately, safely, but at a larger scale and more efficiently. Absolutely. Makes sense. I guess, you know, your background, I know you've worked at different type of companies and obviously you've moved to United Health Optum. I guess in terms of just when you first came to the company and the way they approach maybe AI, I think in our pre-call, you mentioned kind of the shift from, you know, a service to product focus. How is, I guess, your, your experience, your contribution, you know, kind of shaping that? Because obviously with the capabilities that you're putting in place, that's going to be certainly different than maybe what they had previously. Yeah, you know, this is a very large company. We've grown at a tremendous rate since I joined the business. And back when I joined and I came from a technology company, I was at Nokia, there were necessary differences. And I think we are on a journey to enable our business with technology, not just AI, but technology. And I think that does take years sometimes in an industry where in healthcare, we do have a great deal of responsibility almost, given that in many circumstances, the decisions we make on how to optimize and improve with technology will necessarily have an impact on the care that people receive in some cases. And so we have to be really thoughtful there. But I think we're recognizing that, especially with artificial intelligence, some of the decision-making that we had tried to represent in decision trees and rules that just got so complex because healthcare is complex can be represented in very specific cases very effectively in machine learning and artificial intelligence in models where we can train from all this great work we're doing to then maybe encapsulate almost that knowledge into a software or model object that that might scale much faster and much more effectively than you know asking hundreds, thousands more people to review and make the same decisions. Absolutely. Now, I think the road ahead is probably pretty wide open to keep innovating, which has got to be the fun part of being at a, at a company uh, kind of like Optima, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a, a lot in front of us. It's almost like something that can be a little bit overwhelming. Like, you know, you really have to think about what is it that makes sense for you to pursue? Because given the scale we have, we could pursue almost anything and recognizing maybe where to pursue. And also really like, you know, and this goes back to my labs days, you know, being able to say, hey, this is not working. It's not meeting the criteria we need or it's not performing the way we expect you to do it. And just be able to quickly walk away from that and recognize, you know, making that decision to not overinvest in areas and just quickly pivot to what's relevant is extremely important as well. Absolutely. When you're looking at that, I guess the prioritization piece to kind of tie back to budgets, because I think that's probably, you know, at a company of your guys' size, you know, you probably have some pretty uh, intricate budgeting processes as well. Like when you're prioritizing and you're trying to take that, you know, to establish that budget, the roadmap, what are you kind of seeing as maybe the short-term wins versus that long-term vision? Because obviously that's, everyone wants something delivered soon, right? Everyone wants a short-term win, but obviously not sacrificing too much for the long-term. 
Yeah, you know, I think that plays in a lot. And I think, you know, for this audience, for, you know, as we think about like artificial intelligence, all the basics around being successful in innovating in technology exists. You've got to have a great cost benefit analysis or CBA. Like you've got to have a great ROI story. You've got to know how quickly that technology wants to deliver is going to impact results, how long it will take to deliver. All that is sort of, you know, required. None of that changes, I think, in artificial intelligence. But if I think about what's new here that requires maybe some new thinking around return on investment on making a benefit cases is when you have a solution where you've trained a model, you know, typically a machine learning inference is going to give you some type of scoring to essentially classify or infer an outcome. Sometimes it's a binary. It's either, yes, this will happen or no, this won't happen. Sometimes it might be, well, this fits in this bucket versus that bucket. So there's more than one classification. But necessarily, when you do that kind of inference, some things you're going to get right and some things you're going to get wrong. And this goes to the core of, of a lot of our work, which is the confusion matrix. What are the trade-offs of true and false positives? And the reason I bring this up is because from a pure machine learning and data science standpoint, those metrics are somewhat clear to a data scientist, but reflect simply a model performance. But if I go beyond that model performance and say, hey, what is the impact of that inference? Like if I were to train a model to do X in our business today and X costs me $100 to review, but if I get it wrong, it could cost me $100,000. There's a necessary trade-off there where I need to understand how well my model is working. And yes, I might have an amazing AUC or I might have just the you know right F1 to look really good from a model performance standpoint. But if I don't tie it back to the fundamentals of that business and say, hey, what is the impact of a false positive? What is the impact of a false negative? How does that change the dynamics of my business? Then I might have a problem. We've necessarily failed in delivering models that can't meet the rigor of those kind of business trade-offs which is something that we learned early on. And I think sometimes is, is what I encourage everyone in this space, whether they be technical or non-technical to, to understand, because you're gonna have with any model that's not 100% perfect, you're gonna have false negatives and false positives. And you have to understand what the impact of the business is with those. Absolutely. And actually what was just going through my mind is obviously, you know, you guys are a different type of organization, right? So. A software company, let's say, or or a tech company has a different view of of those trade-offs. So when you're actually going to the business leaders and you're talking to them about those trade-offs, how's that conversation sound? It it must be a little bit different than maybe, you know, potentially a new care or or, or different type of business, I'm, I'm assuming. It is, you know, and, you know, early on when we first prototyped these models and proposed using them in our business, it was hard because... Not everyone is steeped in data science and even this sort of statistical analysis like a confusion matrix. You know, these are important business leaders who are intellectually and in their experience leaders in their field, but they just don't happen to be data scientists. So how do you translate those trade-offs back to their business so they can understand that and understand that very quickly? Because these folks are incredibly busy, are running multi-million or sometimes multi-billion dollar businesses and they need to be able to understand this quickly without having to take three days to really understand the underpinnings of your model. We've come upon some ways to visualize these trade-offs by tying almost the dynamics of a confusion matrix to the impact to the business model or the business operating model. That's been really helpful so people can quickly get it. But it's also incumbent on us as builders of AI solutions to really dig into the business itself, understand it on our term, uh, understand it ourselves, I mean, and then really be able to understand what we should expect our model to be able to do and almost be that delegate of that business leader to say, hey, the model doesn't work well enough. You know, sometimes I've noticed, and I've done this too, we've fallen in love with our models. You know, we fall in love with, oh my gosh, I'm doing a convolution on language right now. And that is pretty cool. But if it doesn't meet the business needs, you know, 
as great an architecture it is, as elegant as your training might have been, it doesn't fulfill the need. And we've got to be always grounded in that. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess there's, when you're talking about that, and obviously you need to translate this to somebody's world very quickly. And um, just kind of makes me think about maybe the evolution of the role itself, the industry. I mean, you've, you've been a part of it for a little bit now. And do you see them eventually becoming a, a little bit more of a focus for the business-oriented person within the AI space versus the technology side? Because it, it seems that there's such an integral business component to this and the value that it could bring a company that it just seems like a different skill set almost. Absolutely. So, you know, that's been actually one of my key areas of focus and thinking these days. So if you go back to what I said, I do like I'm responsible for this machine learning platform. When I say platform, it's not simply a set of software tools and compute capabilities to build and train models. It's also facing into what I think of as the change management opportunity or challenge we face with artificial intelligence, where I think being able to educate our employees on how to think about artificial intelligence is probably the most important thing I'm doing right now. If anything, for him to be great partners in designing these solutions, with my team, but also design the solution with just about any team they encounter, whether it be other peer groups or vendors. You know, so many parts of our technology stack today are going to necessarily rely on artificial intelligence. And so, you know, we all need to get a greater deal, more understanding about how these solutions work. I run a learning program. We used to call it Data Science University because we used to focus on training data scientists on machine learning methods. But we recognized in the last year and a half how much more important it is for us to train non-technical audiences on how to take advantage of analytics and artificial intelligence. So non-technical product managers, operational leaders, we're now even exploring how to engage clinicians in learning how to take advantage of artificial intelligence, which is really interesting because clinicians have an interesting set of skills and training that actually is very well suited for machine learning and probabilistic methods. I'm not a clinician or a doctor. I think all of them studied epidemiology in med school and the same type of trade-offs in sort of lab and testing accuracy are very similar to how we think about the accuracy of probabilistic machine learning models. Absolutely. And I guess in that same vein, bringing tools down for them to actually interact with the AI more? I mean, is that part of what the hope is if you're getting them involved more and earlier in the process that you want to get them tools that they're actually able to tactically see the benefits from? You know, I'm not so certain about tools as much as like methods and understanding in the sense that like, you know, I don't know if I'd ask everyone to understand or be able to explain the area under a precision recall curve. And sometimes we like to dazzle people with our cool graphs and plots on how well the models work. But I think understanding those business trade-offs that I described earlier is incredibly important. You know, like when I think about a model and when we deploy it, you know, most of the time it's either something we, we score things asynchronously or we have an API call. It's not like a user interface all the time or, or many times for us when we're making a model object available in a system. And so, you know, I don't know if I think more about tooling as much as really having a process around how we build, train, and then continue to operate and maintain models in production in a way that we can explain, present, and share how they're performing with a business audience. That makes sense. And I'm assuming like on the product side, you know, they're pretty integrated in the process. I mean, it seems like data science, AI product work super closely to obviously bring some of those possibilities to life, you know, making sure that the right experiments are set up. So I mean, is that your view as well in terms of uh, in general working with those product people? Absolutely. Like, and we've even tried to, we started to create tools and ways to memorialize sort of our decisions in the product development process. We've developed uh, our own little canvas that helps us frame not only the business problem, but other facets that are incredibly important to the success of a well-trained machine learning solution. So things like the data, the important questions we need to ask about fairness and bias, the labels that might be present. Bring that all together into a planning document that 
synthesizes all the trade-offs and risks is really nice because then it helps you quickly assess what is likely to succeed and what is likely to require a lot more work or more often than not with a canvas type construct. It just drives an ongoing dialogue to refine both the problem and then how you're trying to solve it. That's awesome. I was going to say this has been a fantastic uh, episode. I think we've covered a pretty wide range of uh, views within your world. And I think with your expertise and your insights, I appreciate your time. I do like to ask just if somebody is listening and has a question, is it okay if somebody reaches out on LinkedIn or or do you have a preferred social that somebody might want to contact you with any follow-up questions? Uh, Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and always open uh, to catch up there. You know, we've got a number of great resources at our Optum website. And uh, I think I referred to our annual Optum AI survey. So those are also great resources as well. And so, uh, you know, I encourage everyone to reach out. I think uh, we always welcome that and and recognize that we are learning a ton in this space. And so we'll learn a lot from folks uh, in the field as well. Awesome. I'll get that link. We'll put it in the show notes when we uh, go live with this so someone can go ahead and uh, visit that site as well. Uh, again, appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, that's it for this episode of the podcast. I appreciate everyone listening. And uh, I always ask two things if you could. One is uh, give us some feedback. That's the only way we can kind of keep growing the podcast if there's something you like or dislike. And then also subscribe to it. If you've liked it, that's the only way we can actually grow the user base. And it's been going well. And I appreciate everyone for doing that. And until next week, thanks.